Okay, continuing down through Revelation, verse by verse, we're at verse 9 of chapter 1, and I do believe that we'll start making more headway going down through this. And it says, I, John, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation. So there, there would be a very, very strong hint to the doctrine of this book, the revelation of Jesus Christ, dealing with the tribulation. You can go with a cross-reference on the word tribulation to Matthew 24, verse 21, uh, regarding the great tribulation. Okay, and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ. Okay, so what's going to follow the tribulation is the kingdom, the millennial kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that will be mentioned at the end of Revelation chapter 19 and 20. And the prophets spend a lot of time on that. That is the number one doctrine of the Bible, the millennial kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ. Kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ. Oh, the amazing thing about the Lord is his patience. And we thank God for his patience. And then it says, Paul or John says, was in the isle that's called Patmos. Okay, so the uh, historians show that John was uh, persecuted. It seems that he was tortured, uh, placed in a, historians say, a pot of boiling oil. They thought he was going to die. He survived it. And then he was exiled to this island called Patmos. It's an island in the Mediterranean. And while out there on exile, you know, the isolation that takes place. You know, isolation is a, is a real way of causing mental anguish and distress on a prisoner or on people. The isolation that uh, people are allowing to happen with this coronavirus in, in nursing homes is a tragedy, what's happened to the elderly, where many of them are dying uh, without uh, anyone around. And the isolation and the loneliness that they're dying is, is a travesty. Uh, on uh, and it's gonna the ones that are gonna be held accountable for that are the powers that be on the national level, and so here Paul was exiled to a place called Patmos. He was exiled for what? For the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. Okay, the word of God corporately we might say the Bible, uh, the testimony of Jesus Christ. That's the spirit of prophecy. And then John says this, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, okay, in the Spirit on the Lord's day. Now, this seems to be an unusual transformation, according to chapter 4, okay, where in verse 2, and immediately I was in the Spirit, and then he was uh, basically taken into heaven. So, the idea there, he was in the Spirit is more than just a person saying, you know, I'm in a mood or anything like that. It seems to be like he was, at that time, uh, transported into the future, a time-traveling machine there. And, and the Lord started revealing to him the things that he witnessed in this book called the book of the revelation of Jesus Christ. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and heard behind me, okay, a, a voice as of a trumpet. Okay, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. Now, in our culture, commonly, the Lord's day is, refer, is a reference to Sunday, okay, the first day of the week. And often, in the early times of American history, everybody rested on Sunday, and they called it the Lord's Day. And that's a good thing, and it's a sad thing that we have fallen out of that pattern. You see, where a lot of folks foolishly, mistakenly say that the Catholic Church has changed the worship from a Saturday to a Sunday. No, the Lord changed it on Acts chapter 2, verse 1. Officially... That's when the Lord changed the day of worship for born-again believers to Sunday. You see, Pentecost, if you run that and understand the Jewish uh, holidays, Passover, the 14th day of the first month, and the day after is an annual Sabbath, and then the seventh day after is an annual Sabbath, and then you'll have your weekly Sabbath in there. Okay, so you have you have Passover, and then you go to the first Sabbath, 
and the weekly Sabbath, and you count seven of those. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Hence, it becomes Pentecost, Pente, five, fifty. And so what comes after the seventh of the seven on a Saturday was a Sunday. So in Acts chapter 2, verse 1, the, that day of Pentecost landed on Sunday, and God did an amazing, unique thing where he took the church and created a living organism, the bride of Christ, in Acts chapter 2, verse 1. That's why in Acts 20, verse 17, the apostles began meeting on the first day of the week in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 2. That's when they had a giving on the first day of the week. So I was in the spirit of the Lord's day and heard behind me a great voice. Now this voice is, is similar to the voice that Adam heard walking in the cool of the garden of the day in Genesis chapter 3. Okay, this voice of the Lord. Psalm 29 talks about the voice of the Lord. And so this will be an appearance of the Lord Jesus Christ himself, the revealing of Jesus Christ, but a particular revealing of Jesus Christ, not in the first coming, but a revealing for the second coming. So in verse 11, he says, saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. What thou seest, write in a book. Okay, and send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia, unto Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. So John sent this book to these seven churches. We would call this Asia Minor today in the region of Turkey and or Greece area. I have a map on the back of the Bible, uh, map number 12, which shows the area of the seven churches. And then in that map, you could also see in the Mediterranean Sea, and then you can see where Patmos was or is, and that's the location where uh, John received the revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so John wrote to these seven churches. Paul also wrote to seven churches. Not the same seven. Ephesus, both of them wrote to Ephesus. John wrote to Laodicea, and Paul wrote to Colossians. And it's interesting that the word Laodicea found two times in Revelation and five times in the letter to the Colossians. So Colossians and Laodicea, we could pair them up. And then he says, and I turned to see the voice that spake with me. Okay, and being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. That's explained later in the chapter or interpreted. And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the son of man. Now, why didn't he say he was the son of man? It's because the last time John saw the son of man, the Lord Jesus Christ, in his resurrected body, he saw him... Uh, in the resurrected body, af right at the first coming. You see, where you have the vision of Jesus Christ in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, but then you have a physical Kodak moment of Jesus Christ recorded in Song of Solomon, chapter 5, verse 10 to 16. So that's the one that John saw, okay, after the resurrection, the resurrected body. This one is the revelation of Jesus Christ. This picture of the Lord Jesus Christ, this revelation is for the second coming. And that's why he says he's like unto the Son of Man. Okay, and so John will use like and as throughout this book because here he has been transported into the future and then he has to write with the terminology that he's given around 95 A.D. So he's going to describe the physical picture of the revelation of Jesus Christ at the second coming, where Song of Solomon describes a physical picture, appearance of the Lord Jesus Christ during his first coming. So what does he look like at a second coming. He's going to be clothed with a garment down to the foot. Okay, that might be the same or similar. Gird about the paps with a golden girdle. 
Okay, so he's got some type of a belt on for his sword. His head and his hairs were white like wool. Okay, there's a difference. Now, the black Hebrews, the black Hebrews are going to try to say, looky there, that makes the Son of Man, Jesus, a black man. No, it doesn't. It's referring to the color of this hair. Okay, white like wool, as white as snow. Okay, and so it's not referring to the type of his hair. The Lord Jesus Christ, in his first coming, in his natural state, is a Jewish man. That's what the woman at the well called him. He looked like a Jewish man, described by Solomon in Song of Solomon 5, 10 to 16. His hair there was black and bushy, black as a raven. His hair here at the second coming is white like wool, as white as snow. This became a tradition in the British culture for the judges to put on that white wig, and in Australia, the white wig. And in Australia, I've witnessed this, and it kind of looks funny to see like a possum on your head. But the idea of this is in Proverbs, in a couple of places, it talks about the wisdom of the hoary head. And so the founding fathers often, George Washington, you'll see his picture with the wig, the white wig on his head. Now, they, they did it according to the idea of Proverbs where it's, it is portraying wisdom. Now, that, that rug they put on their head didn't have AI, advanced intelligence, in it. It was just portraying wisdom. Hopefully they had it. In the context of Romans 1, or Revelation 1.13, is portraying the Lord Jesus Christ to be the judge of the universe. He is not coming with hair black and bushy as a raven, like the first coming in a sacrificial love for, his, love for man and love for the world. He's coming to judge this world for its sin. That's why we have a different description here. And then it says his eyes were as a flame of fire. So he has eyes of judgment. And the, f the fiery uh, look on his face because he is judging the world. The Lord is coming back and boy is he mad. His feet like on the fine brass. Okay, in Song of Solomon, he has legs that are strong and sturdy. He has a midsection of marble, strong and strength. His feet here like fine brass because brass is used for judgment, to portray judgment. And as if they were burned in a furnace. And his voice as the sound of many waters. So he's going to execute justice from his voice. And in Revelation 19, a sword comes out of his mouth. The voice, the sword that's girt about him, that drop the S is the word of God. The sound of many waters will be the power of the force that you can feel when you're standing beside Niagara Falls and you feel that force of that water coming over uh, that cliff there. And that's the voice of the Lord Jesus Christ, the judge of the universe, issuing his orders with his authority and with his power. Verse 16, he had in his right hand seven stars. And out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. I already mentioned that. And his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. Okay, this is why Malachi calls him the son of righteousness, uppercase S-U-N. That's a reference to his second coming <clears throat> where he is coming as a righteous judge to judge the world for its sin. To judge Israel first, the wrath of God portrayed upon Israel, given to Israel, and then to the world. Now, John's reaction is a normal reaction to see something as 
powerful, a man as powerful, God in his full glory. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. He fainted. That's a natural Bible reaction when people had visions of God. Not this funny little fake stuff like Oral Roberts seeing a 900-foot Jesus. Not these goofy little visions that people claim they're having. No, a person faints. That's what Daniel did. That's what I, Isaiah realized his, law, his, um, his uh, condition of unholiness when he, see, when he saw the Lord. Okay, so he, he fell at his feet as dead. He fainted. But the Lord, he laid his hand, right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and death. Okay, so the Lord gives him strength. Okay, as the angel spoke to Daniel, Be strong, I say unto you, be strong after Daniel fainted. And so the keys of hell and death, hell is the prison, okay? And this judge is going to judge the world at the white throne judgment. He's got the keys because he has the authority and the power and the rule, according to 1 Corinthians 15, verse 24. And he, and he gives an outline to John. He says, write to things which thou hast seen. I've gone through this in a previous video. That would, be, that would be Revelation 1, 2, and 3. And the things which are. From John's perspective, that'd be Revelation 4 at the opened door to Revelation 19, verse 11, at the open door. The two times the door is opened. And the present tense for the writer is between the opening of those doors. And the things which shall be hereafter, that will be after the door of Revelation 19, verse 11, going out into eternity. So John is portraying, giving a description of the Son of Man at his second coming. That's why it's different than Song of Solomon's description at his first coming. And then he gives a Bible interpretation, which is given by the Bible itself. The interpreter of the Bible is the Holy Ghost, the writer of the Bible. The Bible is a self-interpreting book. And there's not multiple interpretations of the Bible. There's one interpretation. As the Apostle Peter said, it is most definitely not limited to a church. The first prince of the apostles says it's not limited to a church. <laughs> It's the Holy Ghost that is the interpreter of the Bible. And it says, The mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in, thy, in, thy, in my right hand, the Lord speaking, and the seven golden candlesticks. Okay, so here's the interpretation. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. And the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches. Nothing difficult about that. No Greek and Hebrew needed in order to cloud the issue. No Strong's Concordance needed. It's right there in front of us. The seven stars. Even the famous heathen in the city of angels, Los Angeles, call their people stars. <laughs> Even the famous heathen know this. But the scholars of Alexandria, the famous scholars of Alexandria and the strong concordance and do not understand this simple truth or try to cloud it or try to take credit for it. The stars are the angels, the messengers, the spirit angels that are over these churches influencing the flesh and blood people to fulfill the will of God. And the churches to fulfill that is to let your light so shine among men. And of course, the light is the Lord Jesus Christ himself, the light of the world. Revelation, I'm sorry, John chapter 9, verse 5. So that's the end of chapter 1. We got more things covered there. And we'll start going through chapter 2.